Um, so, ladies and good sir, um, it's a pleasure to be here with you. And of course, it's a pleasure to have my colleague, peer, and compatriot, um, Ms. Michelle, working with me. Just wanted to start off and let you know how thankful I am to be here in this place that I came to 40 years ago. And I was looking at other places to live as a very good man. And it wasn't here, but when I got here, I knew this is the place, even though I love the other places that I've been to so much. And that's a roundabout way of saying uh, thank you so much to the Alquan in this place. This was and still is in so many ways. And I always, always like to mention the Tapu Kwan at the same time, because there was a lot of interaction between the two and a lot of intermarrying from, from what I've read and understand. So, um, I have been teaching children to create and to tell their own stories for about 30 years. And about 24 years ago, I decided that's all I wanted to do for a living. And that's pretty much all I've done for a living. Except now I work at Puna Heritage Foundation, where I still can teach storytelling some, and I do, and I'm very, very thankful for that um, because I think it's the most wonderful thing. I, I think it's the most wonderful thing a human can do. Um, and my Irish uh, roots are, uh, I think, a good indicator of storytelling being something so strong. I would like to also introduce my friend and colleague, Ms. Michelle. Martin, who I've had the pleasure and honor of working with multiple times. She's a great teacher. I'm not going to say what I said yesterday <laughs> about how she's also tough on the kids. <laughs> yeah, she is. She doesn't take any. But she's one of those tough teachers that kids come up and hug, mm -hmm. right? Because she's got that. Mm -hmm. And it's as good as it gets. Yeah. Tough and sweet. Yeah. Good <laughs> and sweet So yourself, then. Yeah. I do I cut the sub day, not cut city, the same time I cut to Canada, Yadi I cut. Ah, the Nay Ka Tagwan Tan, the Chan I cut. Um, they could be hit Tan hit the My second name is Kai Ju. I'm from the Deptain Tan clan and, um, I am a child of the Chukunedi clan, and which is my dad's people. And then I'm also a grandchild of the Navajo people, as well as the Kongwan Tons. Um, I, my house for the Dapte Tan is the Raven Nest House. And um, I say Kuna Kawu because Kuna, um, where it's at now, that's when they migrated after the glacier went over there. Their, um, their, uh, their community. And um, so in Glacier Bay, where Kaguantans, Chukunetis, Bushitans, and Dapdaytans, they had a vast land over in Glacier Bay. And so that's why we call it Funakawu. Funakawu because it's a vast land. And that's what my grandfather, Richard Belton, shared. And I've heard him say many times about Funakawu. You'll hear like um, Kutsunamu Kwan, which is that place, or, but Kuna is the only one. And I'm sure there's other communities that had to migrate to other areas, had vast lands. We didn't just stay in one community, we had vast lands. Um, I'm the TCL fourth fifth grade teacher over at Harvard And if you don't know what TCL is, it's the Clinton Cultural Language and Literacy Program. Um, I've been in that program for quite a few years with my children going in there, being a parent volunteer first, and then being a para in there for all the grades, and then being a cultural specialist in there. And um, I don't know, I did so many roles in, at Harvard View. But I also grew up in Huna, where I um, did the Parents as Teachers program for two years over there, which is preschool, which is a really important age. And I was so grateful to be in that position because it really taught me, the team that I was with, taught me a lot of how important early childhood is. 
And um, and not only that, but I always believed of connecting with parents. That was a, an important role that parents and teachers program had and just really working with the parents because they are the first teachers. And so looking at that with that program, I've learned a lot and brought it along with me at the TCL again. But before that, I went, I lived in Cape where my husband was from, and that's where I got into teaching. I did every position possible at Cape School District. And I finally decided because money was so short every year, and I was either laid off or part time, and living in the village where my husband was a logger at the time was seasonal. It was really hard. So I decided to move back to Juneau and bring my family. And I was in the PUNAS mm -hmm. program all through school up to my master's. And so I was able to become a teacher and was able to stay here. And so, um, so yeah, that's just a little bit about me. I've been in TCLO learning and learning along the way, but also making the synapses connect with the culture that I was surrounded by. Because I can't say it enough. There's language, but culture is a big part of the language. Learning what the culture is. And I'm an anthropologist. That's my undergraduate. And like all anthropologists say, you need to live in the community at least a year, a minimum of a year observing and seeing that culture and um you know and i grew up with my grandparents and i was around the culture but i wasn't taught the language but i've seen what they did and it's amazing the things as an adult that come back to me and those synapses connect again and i'm like oh yeah like these pieces there's so many things that come back to me with these artifacts from the museum and so being able to expose my students to that with the hands-on place-based experiences, especially field trips. Those are the most, they're gonna, that's all they're gonna remember is the field trips, right? And those experiences. And that's what I love about working with Brett is they're able, we can see those experiences come out of their stories and um, just sharing their oral stories because that's how our people work, we are oral people. And the story may change many, many different times, but that's okay. And so working with Brett, integrating this into the classroom, place-based, culturally relevant is a lot of fun to do. And I have extensions at the end to share about what Brett does in the classroom. I've done extensions before he came in to introduce oral stories. And then Brett would do his magic with the stories. And then I would go on to the writing portion and extend on that. Like, all right. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, so <clears throat> I want to leave the world of tech as quick as possible. So I'm just going to show you something. I'm going to show you where I obtained these various artifacts and regalia. Okay. And if you would be kind enough, this, and this is a link, there's a it's on number two in the back. It says class schedule. Okay. And, thank you so much. Yeah. And we go way back. Yeah. We go way back <laughs> to your school. Um, so this is a uh, this is where I got these artifacts from Sheldon Jackson Museum in Sitka. Okay. They have a program and have had a program for decades. Where, and now you can go online and you can choose what you want. Okay, miscellaneous, Aleut, Athabascan, on and on. Okay, I'm going to choose Northwest Coast uh, 20, although there's more than that. Search. So there's 130 objects that they will send to you. And they ship it free. The only catch is when you ship it back, you have to pay the postage to ship it back. Schools will normally have some sort of budget to do that because it doesn't cost that much. It's a box. I got a really big box because I was going all out with big items, but you don't have to do that. So you <clears throat> figure out what you want, okay? And you just click on it, and then you can add it to your request like that, and then you find something else.
It's like that. And it's easy. And it's inexpensive. And kids get that hands-on, kinesthetic connection with the materials. Hi, I remember you, but I'm not. Where? Where? Yeah. What? But what's... It might be actually a tool set. Okay, tool set. That's it. Okay. Yeah. All right. Lady Nicole, yeah. if you'd be so kind as to make the, just the poof. Absolutely. <laughs> All right. Okay. So. I can take two days to, to teach this class, and I love it when I have that time, and I don't have that time. So, but I'm also not going to rush this. I'm just cherry picking. <laughs> but I thought it was important for one thing to say basically why I focus so much on storytelling and education. Why, on a far and away thing, it's the most important thing that a teacher can do and to teach. And not necessarily the way I do it, I like it, but storytelling. Humans, it looks like we've been on the planet for about 300,000 years. That's what most anthropologists are going right around there right now. When I was taking anthropology and becoming a cultural anthropologist, it was 100,000 years, okay? but that's changed. Storytelling has been the only method of teaching. That's because it was 200,000 years ago, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's true. That's the, that's the only way humans have been imparting the knowledge is through story, right? Because we didn't have any other way. Okay. What that says to me is that in that 300,000 years, we have adapted to storytelling. We have evolved the storytelling as being it. That has been it. The last 5,000 years, we started to get writing, although most people didn't write. It'd be way less than 1% of any population did any, did any reading and writing, all right? And then later on, you get other ways of teaching, but we have grown and evolved with this, okay? And in education, which we are all in education here, most people would think reading and writing is the basis for education, okay? Because it's it's there with everything we do, K-12. But I think we forget that speaking and listening is the foundation for reading and writing. And most of us as teachers don't do a lot of focusing on just speaking and listening. We teach as we were taught. Really, that's what teachers do. We teach as we were taught, primarily. Sometimes we're able to get out of it some. But if speaking and listening is the foundation of reading and writing, and if storytelling is the primary mode of what we evolved to do, then we need to pay more attention to this. And the reason why I believe it's not a focus is because it's more difficult to measure, or so people think. Reading and writing is more difficult to measure for testing because we're so test-oriented. We're so test oriented that we teach reading and writing in preschool. We start teaching in preschool and then kindergarten and so on. Unlike they do in Finland, where they don't do any reading and writing until the age of seven. Okay, they just do oral language stuff. And you all would probably know that Finland has consistently had the highest scores. Uh, sometimes they're number two or something like that in the world for, for, you know, for in academics. And they're, they're testing reading and writing there, but that's, they don't even do that until later. So this is why I think it's so important. Okay. What we're gonna do today is I will teach this class as if I'm teaching a class of first graders or seventh graders or seniors or in college or anything. I teach it basically the same way, except, of course, I'll interact with you like the professionals that you are as we talk about it. Okay, so it won't be completely like, okay, kids, kind of like that. All right. And what we're going to do is you will learn the foundation for what I call performance literacy and how to integrate place-based materials into that storytelling. That's what we're going to do. You all will create the story. You all will tell your story. 
and hopefully we'll have time to hear one or two or more depending on the time people tell the story. If, if being in public and speaking isn't your bag, don't worry about it because it always works and everybody does it. And we can't have conversations about the money. We can't. Okay, all right. You got me. All right. So um, I will start out with a story. And again, because I don't have a whole lot of time, I'll tell a short one. The story is called The Last Day of the Deer. One day, the old buck deer was walking, walking up the mountain trail. Every day he went up until he got to a large meadow and there he would eat the sweet grasses, leaves from the bushes. But this day as he was walking, it was more difficult than it had ever been and he knew he was getting old and didn't have long to live. When he got to the meadow, he began eating the sweet grasses and the leaves from the bushes. Then he heard a sound and he turned to look and there, bedded down in the grass was a fawn, a baby deer. And standing over it was a wolf, about to kill and eat the deer. But when the buck saw that, he charged the wolf, and when the wolf saw him, he charged, they began to fight. And the buck hit the wolf with his antlers, and he flew through the air and hit the ground. But he was young and strong, and he ran behind the old buck and bit and ripped his back leg. And then he bit and tore his other back leg. And as the buck was falling, the last thing that he saw was the fawn running into the woods. The fawn running into the woods was the last thing the old buck saw before the wolf bit. Okay. So, <laughs> um, you notice I didn't tell the story like this. I didn't go. There was an old buck deer. Every day he would walk up the mountain. He would walk up to, he got to the large meadow. I didn't do it like that. What did I do that was different? What was different than telling a story like this? Movement. Use movement. Hmm? Interval. What else? What else is different Pauses. from telling a story like this? What's that? Pauses and variation in tone. Nice. A bit like are you creating the landscape. Not just doing the act. Yeah, yeah. And I really like that. <laughs> and and did you notice also what did I do with my face? Because my face wasn't just like this. Very expressive. What's that? Very expressive. Expressive. Yeah. And so here we have it. Sound and expression and movement. Okay. Kids do the same thing. They tell me the same. They use. They'll use, they always tell me movement, sound, and they don't always use that exact word, but that's what they say. And expression, I usually do that part, especially with younger kids. Older kids, I don't have to. With young kids, I will, I'll, you know, I will elicit that information from them saying, you know, what was, what was this? What was I doing there? And then I'll ask them, why? Why do you think I use sound and movement and expression? Why did I do that? Why not just tell the story like this? And the students will tell me reasons for that. And I'll write it up on the board, just like I did that. Like for instance, maybe you'd be kind enough to tell me why in sound and movement expression. Why would I do that when I tell a story? To help people relate to it. Helps people relate. Mm -hmm. What else? Making an impression. Taking us with you. Take, they come with me. Mm -hmm. What else? Multiple senses. What's that? Engaging multiple senses. Yes. It's fun. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I write all these things up. The core of it to me is what you said, Emily. The core of it. But there's many, many reasons. 
but we all learn differently. Some of us are more visual learners, some are more audio, some more kinesthetic. But if you've got all those in your story, then you know that your audience is learning the story. They're understanding it so much better. And then you think about, oh, what does that have to do with vocabulary and the sentence structure and all that? Because vocab that's the best way to learn vocabulary is to see it come alive. And sentence structure, okay, and stories, because what happens is kids write their stories like books, basically, okay? They're using actually what we call more like book language than they do home language or neighborhood language when they're writing. It's really interesting. All right. So after it's really bugging me. I don't know why it shouldn't, but it does. So after eliciting this from the students, I will teach them what a visual portrait of a story is. Okay. And I create this right in front of them, but I've already done it to get ahead of time a little bit. So I want to ask you in that story, the last day of the deer, what do you remember from the very beginning of that story? What happened? Go ahead. But the walking. Okay. Walking where? Um, in the forest in the middle. Walking. And on her is in the I'm just going to put Meadow, because Meadow's family's here today. I saw her. She was yeah. actually coming to me. What was the problem in the story? What was the problem in the story, the last day of the year? The fallen who was being attacked. The fallen being attacked. The fawn being attacked. And if that was the problem, Let's solve that problem. And I'll ask you, Tara, because you gave me that. So it's logical you would go there. What was the solution to the problem of the fawn being attacked? Let's solve that problem. Buck distracting. Buck distracted. Fawn. And what happened at the very end of the story? What happened at the end? of the last day of the year. <laughs> nice. How do I write like that? Um, could you give me a few words, perhaps, good sir? Death of the buck. Huh? Death of the buck. Yeah, death of the buck. And also, positive. OK. And just to put this out there, I also teach this and I go into it with the kids some, but not everybody, probably not everybody agrees with you, Tara, that the problem was the fawn being attacked. Sure. And I would disagree that the ending was the death of the buck. Okay. All right. And the this is great. The next the fine. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And we'll have a conversation with the students about how every story, every book, there's actually multiple problems and multiple solutions. And I think that's really important for kids to hear it from an adult, from a teacher, because we're taught that there's, there's a conflict and resolution. And if it's not the same conflict and resolution as the teacher thinks it is, or the person who created the test for that, then you're wrong. And that's wrong. Because the, the true problem and solution or conflict and resolution is what the person brings to the story, not what the story is taking to them. Okay. So I, I tell kids that because I want them to know that, that even if they're marked wrong on that type of thing, it doesn't mean that they are wrong. But it might be a good idea to try and figure out what the person who's asking the question wants as an answer. With a visual portrait of a story, you should draw a picture that reminds you of the story. That picture reminds me of the story. Do you have any idea why I have kids? This is a graphic organizer, right? Um, why do you think I asked them to draw a picture that reminds them of the story? Why would I do that? 
We don't normally do that when we're writing. So yes. Just to get another sense, I guess. Another medium. Another another sense, another medium. Yes. Yeah. Immediate. You don't have to read and see that and everything comes back to you. Yes. Because when you're about to tell your story, you're just seeing that little graphic and you can go on. And when I created this thing, I wasn't thinking that. I don't know why I asked the kids to illustrate this. The first time I taught it was in 91 or 92. And I really don't know why I, I did that. But what I began to hear time and again from teachers was that little Jimmy doesn't write, but now he's writing. Okay. And I would also notice some kids, before they wrote any text at all, they would draw a picture and then they would do text because there's always a percent, always, of course, not always, but almost every time in any class, you have 20 kids, you're going to have some that are so visual, okay, that's so much their medium that if they don't have a chance to do that, their connection is, is much weaker than it would be otherwise. But if they have, if they have the opportunity, to draw something, then it all comes out. It's their doorway to text. Okay. So I, I realized that in the first like two or three times I taught it. So I was really glad that I somehow made that up. All right. So I'm just going to write subject here. I could write other things, um, but this is what your class is going to write about, okay, the subject matter, because this process works with anything, really. It works with science, it works with history, works with, well, I've seen it work with chemistry before. Um, I've seen it work with math, although I, I've never been able, I've never taught that, but I've seen a teacher take it that way. And in this class, we're focusing on regalia and art from a specific place, Okay, and that's this place. And so as the teacher, that's what the subject is for me here today to work with you. And now is the time that I want you to spend a little bit of time looking at what we have, what I was able to get from Shelly Jackson. Okay. And I'm doing this to kind of ignite your brains and what you want. Go ahead and touch some of this stuff if you would. Anything. Stand up and see something you like that or another. Here's a fish trap model, a small paddle, a halibut foot, a doll, a wolf mask, a frog bowl. And I want to steal this. No, I mean, really. Oh. <laughs> but, but, but I can't, you know, because you know, the guilt would just be too much. But so just take a look at this stuff because you're going to write a story that is inspired by these objects. And it may be that you choose something that's not here, but that is also Northwest Coast. That's fine. I don't care. Um, that. Yeah. Ladies and gentle, sir. Um, I also invite someone to talk about these wherever I happen to be. Um, I don't want it. I don't want it to be me who's the fount of the knowledge. So, so you, but you can, I've, I've always been able to get an elder or someone else from a particular village to come in and talk about items that are there. And often you get two or three people to, because what we're trying to do is a couple things. One is build background knowledge because you can't write about stuff you don't know about. You just can't. And pretty much every writer will say, we write what we know. And you can't write about stuff that you don't know. So I have someone come in and talk about stuff like this. So just to be clear with that, and it doesn't have to be you. And it may have to be you for some reason. Maybe for some reason you can't get people in. And I don't know. There's all sorts of situations. But, the, but as long as the kids get some of that connection and then get this kinesthetic part as well, then they're raring to go. And this says, I'm raring to go. So the next step is I would like for everybody in here, if you'd be so kind, is to tell me what piece, what artifact, if you were going to write a story, which one would you choose? And it doesn't have to be one of the ones that's in this room. It could be something else that's connected 
with the Northwest Coast, or more specifically, if you wish to get culture. Okay. So I'm going to let you think about it for a few seconds. And then when I choose you, you don't, this doesn't have to be what you write about, I, but I just want you to tell me of everything you're thinking now and everything you see in here, what would you choose? I would like to start with Ms. Blenner. How the coach? How the coach? Ms. Emily. The fish trap. They found one on Montana Creek here. It was 700 years old. And they've got it in the city museum, and they reconstructed it. It's really amazing. I didn't get. I did get your name, but I was. Re I'm really bad at names. Garrett. Garrett. Okay. What would you choose? Um, I guess the frog hole. I was born with my feet backwards, both of them, and my mom called me her little toady frog. Mm -hmm. Um. I'm sorry. Oh, no, no, no wonder. No, I, I was the object that you would choose. Oh, okay. Um, I would, so earlier today in, in the session that I was in before this one, um, Paul Marx told the oratory of the uh, Ashigania and how um, Okay. How Okay. Great. Great. Mr. Mirfin. The box. Okay. Bentwood box. Spruce or cedar? I was going to say cedar and then I thought, oh, I say it wrong. <laughs> Do you know other things about cedar? Yeah, she's got a brother named Cedar. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, what? It's not funny. Okay. So it's not going to be my favorite part of this. Class. So I would like someone to tell me a problem that could be associated with one of the objects up there that we've uh, identified. What could be a problem associated with one of those? Yes. A storyline I'm thinking of involves illness. 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 Okay. And do you want it with any particular? With the, the frog bowl. Okay. And I'm not going to write that. I was just curious. Oh. Illness. Oh, this is yeah. Sure. You can move the thing if you want. Yeah. So nice. Um, if the problem is illness, what could be a solution? Herbs. The, the herbs. Herbs to... oh. <laughs> well, I that. herbs. What could be a different solution? Someone gets sick. And herbs isn't what that doesn't solve that problem. What could be another one? The kindness of all the rest of people in the world. Did you say the kindness? Uh -huh. So nice. Yeah, love that. Kindness can make you better or it can help your, your way out. Or laughter. Yeah, there we go. So nice. Um, another problem. What's another problem that could be associated with this object? I can't open a box. Can't open a box. Nice. What could be a solution to that? What could possibly solve the problem of not being able to open a box? Another object. Go to a different object? Yeah, using a tool. Okay. What's a different one? Yeah. Get Raven to open it. Yeah. <laughs> now we're talking. I was thinking like that urgent horse thing. I can't read this. Sorry. <laughs> nice. All right. Okay. Give me something else. Another problem. 
Yes, sir. The box is empty. <laughs> okay. <laughs> empty box. He's stuck on these boxes. Well, it's my it's just box. Thing. No, it's wonderful. But I had a lot of potential. <laughs> <laughs> what could be a possible solution to having a box that you are so enamored of and you open up and there's nothing in there? Yes, to put in the box. Yeah. Nice. Nice. Arms berries for the box. Maybe you have to go on an adventure to find a different box. Ooh, okay. Adventure to find a new box. One more problem. Hello and welcome. I was thinking of a lost yeah, hat. Yeah, I know, but welcome. Um, what were you saying? A, a lost hat, or it may be a found hat. Lost. I'll stick with lost for right now, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the object means something to the person a lot. They lose it. What could be a solution to that? <clears throat> this lost piece of art or functioning utilitarian object that is also art. Right. What could be a solution? Ask the tree people who has it because they won't have seen it all. Because they what? They have the best hand it's fun. They just call it. Ask the tree people who, who has the best. Nice. Okay. All right. What could be another possible solution? Go uh, hunt to find it. Hmm? Try to find it. Try to find it. I know what they'd say in Michelle's class. Talk to their auntie or uncle. Make a new one. Because mm -hmm. that happened in three of the stories, I think, in your class last time. Yeah. Yeah, something got broken or lost, and they just immediately went to the appropriate person. All right. Okay. Um, so let's take us. Let's stop for just a second and look what's happened here. So the teacher tells a story, and of course, we tell it and use sound and expression and movement. And you all said the reasons why. I normally write those on the board, okay, so the kids can see it. They have told me this. And they have told me the reasons why to use sound and expression movement in the story. Then I told the story. And after telling the story, the class, the students told me what the beginning was, what the problem was, what the solution, what the end was. Then we looked at different objects and students told me ones that they thought would be interesting for a story. And then when I asked what problems and solutions could possibly go with those objects, students told me that. Can you see a theme here? What's going on? I'm eliciting that information from the students. It's they're generating all of this. Why do you think I do it that way? Why? Because nobody has nothing to say. Has what? Nothing. Yeah, there, yeah, nobody has nothing to say. Nobody has something that they thought. Nobody has nothing to say. Like that. <laughs> yeah. What's another reason? Belongs to everyone. It's the proof of ownership. Being belongs to everyone. Ownership. And to me, that's that's the biggest key because there's multiple other reasons to multiple reasons to do this. Student centric. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes. I like it. Yeah. The and I I don't like this term, so help me come up with a, a better one. With buy-in, the students' mm -hmm. buy-in is greatly increased when they've gone through something. Mm -hmm. like this. Okay. Yeah. They 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 feel vested. Nice. All right. So uh, 
kind of went to the system. Yeah, sure. Because wrong yeah, answer. Think that, let's get out. <laughs> check this out. Seriously, that that language that I just used is it works really, really well. That's how I talk to students. I ask them something like that. Would you be kind enough to assist me? And maybe out of 200 kids, I'll get one who'll say no, or 500 kids say yes. And I know you, you're working with this conference, and I don't even know if you're supposed to be a student in it. Okay. Oh, I'm, I'm taking notes. I saw that, <laughs> and that's why I wanted to ask you if you can come Yeah. All right, come on, Jared. Jared, what I'm going to ask you to do mm -hmm. is to create, you're going to model for everyone else how to create a visual portrait of a story. You're going to show them how to do that. Okay. So, so what I'm going to do is just draw that, which is like a sheet of paper turned sideways. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to hand this to you. And I'm going to ask you to make that thing that looks like a couple of mountains. Mm -hmm. Can you put that there, please? All right. Um, yeah, just like. Oh, just write it. Yeah, just go like that. Oh, just yeah. make that little thing right there. Nice. And then down this corner, write B for beginning. And that one, right? And that one, right? And then the last one. Wonderful. Okay. And you see how he was able to do that without me telling it to. And I mentioned this because. Kids, again, out of hundreds of kids, I might get one I have to do more of a direction on. Okay. But usually they just do it. And that tells me something. That tells me that they're listening, focusing, right? If you'd be kind enough, I want you to choose a subject for you to write about. It could be one of these or it could be something different, as long as it has to do with the Northwest Coast Pirates artifact. Yeah. Whatever you want and put it right at the top, kind of like the way I put it. Nice. And now, under the P for problem, would you write a problem that could be associated with that? Any problem that you want. And would you choose a solution for, for that it's not catching how but His solution was to reach out to uncle to teach him. Okay. So, ladies and gentlemen, may I? Mm -hmm. uh, please join me in giving Jared a hand for helping out here. Absolutely perfect. And now you've created your visual portrait. The only thing you haven't done is write a beginning and an end and drawn a picture that reminds you of your story. But this is the hard part. You've done the hard part. And that's a hard part for any writer. It's choosing what you're going to write about. And then it's choosing what the problem and solution is in that story. Okay. Once that's done, a beginning is easy. An end is easy. And what you just showed was in two minutes, you can get the hard part of writing a story done. Okay. And the other stuff is just fun and easy. And I say that to the students too, the same thing. And they go, oh, yeah, okay, I get this. Nice. And you see you teach like, K through college. Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, it, works. it just makes so much sense, right? Because then you don't get stuck on going, what am I going to write about? I don't know what to write about. I'm getting lost. I don't know what to write for a beginning. Once you've done this, the beginning is easy. It just is. And the end is easy. So well done, sir. Well done. Okay. <laughs> So now that you've seen how to create a visual portrait of a story, I want you to write one. What? I want you to create one. I know, I know. I'm gonna give you about eight minutes. You'll do the same thing that Jared did, except you will put 
a beginning and an end in on yours, okay? And you will draw a picture that reminds you of the story. I mean, anything, that, as long as it reminds you of the story. So I'm going to give you all an entire sheet of eight and a half by 11 to do this on. Um, you don't have to do what most teachers do, which is make theirs about this big. Because <laughs> they're teachers and figure they got to save paper or something like that, right? So use the whole thing. Use all that real estate there. I actually use, usually use 11 by 17, and I like it to be thicker. But you can do this on, you know, basically anything. You're welcome. Okay, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Wherever you happen to be, um, feel fine about putting your pen or pencil down. If you want to just keep writing while we're talking, that's fine too. Um, yeah. Miss Stark, would you be kind enough to assist me? Yes. Yes. Of course. Here, bring your visual book. Yeah. All right. So we're going to show them how we do something called telling and retelling the story. And at this point, I should tell you guys um, anything that you would like, any resources on this, articles and stuff, I have plenty of them. Um, that explain this process in detail from beginning to end. I also have a book on it. I'd be happy to send you. It's I can send it to you. It'd be free. It's in PDF format. And it's got a whole lot of things about storytelling that we're not doing today, but it also, the heart of it is what we're doing today. So just keep that in mind. Um, so Tara and I are going to show telling and retelling the story. And this is how it's going to work. I'm going to tell you a story that you've never heard. And then when I'm done, you'll tell it back. And then I'll tell you a story. And when I'm done, you tell it back to me. Okay. Yeah, it's easy. Don't worry about it. Seriously, it can be so easy. And you're going to get it. All right. Sorry, Michelle, you're going to have to hear the story again, but it's perfect for this. This story is called The Hungry Crow. It goes like this. Once upon a time, there was a crow. She was hungry and looking for food, but she didn't see any food. The only thing she saw was a garbage can. So the crow flew down to the garbage can. She tried to get the lid off, but she wasn't strong enough. When she looked around, she saw a bear. So the crow, flew over to the bear. Hey, bear! What? There's food over there. Where? Over there. The bear saw the garbage can. Walked over. Knocked the lid right off. Bang! And then the bear started to eat. And eat. And eat. And the crow got worried. The bear would eat all the food. So she flew down. She pecked him right in his eye. Peck! And the bear went Mah! and ran away. And the crow began to eat and eat and eat. And then she went, ah, I'm fat now. And she flew away. Yeah. Okay. Now, um, Let's switch places, point you. <laughs> and uh, just a couple things. One, I don't expect you to tell it exactly like I did because you're different than me and you're not a video recorder. So you're going to use some different language sentences. Okay. Um, and I don't expect you to use the same motions I do. Again, because you're you, and you'll do it differently. But when you tell it, do, you know, try to have some movement in it and sound if you can. And I'm right here to help you should you need any help. And it always helps to say the title first, 
the title is The Hungry Crow. So just, just go. I was just going to have to read poet. Yeah. That's not what happened. <laughs> yeah. Here we go. <clears throat> the Hungry Crow. It was a crow. It's really hungry. <laughs> I'm hungry. <laughs> he saw a garbage can. <laughs> that it was too heavy to get into the trash can, <laughs> the garbage can. And he saw um, a crow. He saw a bear. Mm. Hey, bear. Found, found some food over here. <laughs> so the bear drops everything, <laughs> comes over, <laughs> knocks the lid off the can, and <laughs> bear is very happy to have some food. <laughs> and crow is watching, waiting for bear to be done. Bear, keep going. <laughs> and so crow gets a little bit worried that there won't be enough left for him comes over and swoops down and pokes him right in the eye. The bear scampers off. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I gotta work on my character development a little bit. <laughs> nice. Take a bow. You for that. Okay, so now I want you to tell me your story. Oh. Yeah. This one? Yeah, so. That's it. So. <clears throat> he, um, a boy in his hat. One afternoon, boys out fishing, catching chum after chum after chum. And whoa, on his line, all of a sudden, ooh, 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 he lands a king salmon. And he's so proud. This king salmon is his first king of the summer. And he needs to share this king salmon with his family. And his grandmother is all the way through the meadow and through the forest and around the boulders. And he goes, but first, he's not sure what weather or he will encounter. So he gets a little pocket knife because he's got a special hat. And his mother says, be careful with that hat. You no, know, that's a very special hat. So wear it wisely. Oh, of course, mom, I've got it, no problem and puts on his very special hat and goes through the meadow and he's got his fish over his shoulder and through picking flowers and through the forest and it gets kind of dark and be creepy and coming along around the boulders and climbs over and there's grandmother's house and he goes to hold his hat as he's running down the hill and oh no he's not wearing the hat he's got the fish to go to grandmother's house. So he brings grandmother fish. Grandma is my first king salmon. He's so big and I want to leave it with you, but I have to go. I have to go because I don't my hat. I've lost my hat. So around the boulders, up over the boulders, and through the dark forest, looking everywhere for the hat. Finally, finally, there by the wildflowers. <laughs> boy in his hat. This boy had such a special cedar hat that his grandmother had made for him. He loved it and it kept his head warm and dry even when the mighty rains came. And one morning he went out fishing catching these big chum they hadn't quite turned yet oh they'll be good we'll eat some of them we'll give some to the dogs and then whoa what is this and he pulls out a giant king salmon flopping around whoa grandma will love it she gets this one because she's so special so <laughs> walks it on the head 
picks it up, gets his fishing gear, and walks to grandma's house. It's not too far, but he has to go over some boulders, oh, through a dark forest, fording a stream, and he finally gets to grandma's house, but just before he opens the door, it's raining and his head is cold and wet. My hat, my hat that grandma gave me. Not, not, grandma. Oh dear, come on in. Grandma, I got you this great big white king. I love you so much, grandma. We're gonna have a big feast with it. I know you love white king the best. I do too, I do too. But grandma, the hat that you made me that I love so much. I don't know where it is. It's somewhere between where I was catching fish in here. Grandma, can I go get it before we eat? Oh, yeah, you got that hat, honey. Go get that hat. Bye, I'll fix it. Bye. So he goes out and he crosses that stream and he goes to the dark forest, and then over some boulders. And why, there's that little patch of flowers that I was smelling because Grandma always said, don't forget to smell the flowers. And that's where my hat is. So come on, right there. Grandma would love that I found that. Yeah. You'll notice that Tara's telling of my story was different than my than mine, but the same story. She told it as she tells it and remembered it. And the same with me with hers. Here's what I think is really important with this. When she hears my story and tell it, she's learning about things, right? And, and then when she tells it back to me, I get to hear my story and she's not gonna tell it just the way I did. She may use new vocabulary, which she did. She's gonna use different sentence structure, which she did. And she may even have a few ideas in there that are different from the way I did. And I, when I write the story, because I will write it after that, after we do this process, I will incorporate things if I like them into my story. And as I tell the kids, that's not cheating at all. That's not stealing. It's not plagiarism. Every book in this room, and I notice this room doesn't have a lot of books, um, but every book <laughs> has been gone through editors, right? And people have looked at it and it's changed since it was first. That's how books are always done. Okay. It's not cheating. It's wise to make a story better once you learn some stuff about it. Okay. So telling retelling is really powerful. And here's something that I would like you to think about a little bit. You all have created a visual portrait of a story. This is really your first draft. Okay. And then when you tell your story to someone, that's the second draft. And then when they hear it back, that's the third draft. These are all drafts. So when I actually start to write my story, it's the fourth draft. And you've done revising and editing already. And you know how kids hate to rewrite so many of them? Yeah. You've already done your rewriting in your head. All right. So anyway, let's give that Tara a round of applause. Thank you very much. He was hesitant to come up well, and, and, and did such a wonderful job that I might be out of a job. Um, <laughs> so now, um, this class is over at what time? 150? Okay. What I want you to do is tell and retell with a partner in here. Now, if you happen to have a story that's kind of long, make it short, okay? Because we don't have time, like I say, I can take two full days. So find a partner, find somewhere in this room or you can go out in the hall if you want and tell and retell your story. Tell and retell. And Tara, you don't have to if it's just a, um, a weird number. You just have to listen to someone and tell it back. Okay. Yeah. But you don't have to do, you don't have to tell your story again. Okay. So get a partner. Tell and retell. And when you do it, you have to be standing up. Because if you're sitting down, uh, you just don't use movement very well, sound and expression. Just, oh, so I'm sitting down. Yeah. So whoever's telling the story has to be standing up. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, wherever you happen to be with this, I'm going to unfortunately ask you to cease. And that's because I'm battling time even more than normal because. We didn't even get a start until like what 10 or 15 yeah. minutes after it was supposed to and it's just the way it is 
What's that? I'm kind of telling stories in French. I know, I know. And I told him no. I told him no. You can't use your own language. <laughs> um, by the way, doing this, I've worked in a lot of international students. And often in a class of 25 kids, I'll have 20 of them where English is not their first language. And I'll have some kids that hardly speak any or no, they like come to the school a week or two, and they're they're just learning the language. And when they go through this, here's what happens: they create a story in their own language. They put in any word if they know any English words, they put those into the story. Okay, <laughs> and then they tell their story like that to the class. And what teachers have told me is that has been a real icebreaker for those children mm -hmm. because when their classmates see them telling a story in their own language and maybe putting in a couple of English words, maybe a few, um, for some reason it breaks some barrier and they begin to treat that person differently and positively. So and I've heard this enough times that I believe it and I don't know why it's like that, but it's like that. I would normally have one of you tell the story now and then go on. But this class, I think, started 15 minutes late. And I already had done everything I could to pare this down. And I'm really sorry because a highlight is then for me to sit and hear one of you tell your story, much like you did, right? But now they've, you've already had a chance to tell it once and hear it told once. So you do an even better job. But you'll have to just go on my word with that. I would like to say something else. This process, I usually get about 95% of the kids to tell their story. This is a, I work, usually work for a week in a school, and by Friday, usually 95% of the kids will tell their story to not just their classmates, but I always invite another class in, hopefully younger kids, and invite their parents to sit in the back, and they tell their story. And that's a big deal. That one or two, sometimes three, who wouldn't do it because they're too shy, I'll have them tell it with a partner. Okay, So they will say the story and their partner acts it out or flip that. And sometimes I tell their story for them. And I'll say, you know, this is, um, this is Susan's story and I get to tell it. And then I'll tell it. And I'm saying this, I'm bringing this out because I want you to know that students find this process non-threatening once they've been through it, to the point where even your shy kids will stand up in front of total strangers. And you may well know that in the United States, I don't know if this is true outside of it, but when they're asked annually, what do they fear the most? It's public speaking. They put that above death. And some of you probably know this. Some of you have probably read this before because this, this sort of thing comes out like once a year somewhere buried in a newspaper or whatever. There you yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, and I was I was going to have the inimitable and most wonderful uh, Ms. Martin here tell you about um, extensions she's done with this where her kids have um, written their own graphic novels of their stories after this and you know illustrated them and they're beautiful uh, but I don't have time for that I do want to ask one I do want to ask one thing would you be kind enough uh, Michelle to mention uh, what the feedback you've gotten from parents is oh yeah um, so after Brett's done with the storytelling, we practice, and um, parents have come in, even last, was it last year? Yeah, it was last year. Um, even with COVID, you know, we got really good at wearing masks and making sure we're spaced out, and the kids were really good about it, and it was just fun for them to see their kids actually acting and sharing stories. And um, and I tell them, you tell stories every day. Like, Mr. Shower, this is what happened yesterday or something. So just connecting them to that and then having their parents hear, hear them. And even the shy kids, the ones that 
are shy the first day or unsure of themselves, they just come forward. And I haven't had one student since I've worked with Brett not tell the story. And so, and we do like um, a short at lunch hour, invite families for like storytelling and tea. And I try to do it in the winter time because that seemed like the appropriate time when we would tell oral <laughs> stories if we weren't, if we were with our plans. So it's a really, it's it's a welcoming space for parents to come and be in the classroom with us and to see their children. And we always get high attendance and a lot of great feedback when we do that. So I try to do that at least every trimester with a project base like this to show their parents. And it's nice to have that community with them too. Um, I am available for any questions. Um, or materials, my contact information here, and I'm very happy to answer any questions or send you anything that you may wish. And you all have been absolutely wonderful. And thank you so much for coming. You did my heart well. I hope your heart is beating a little warmer. And, uh, and I hope that you walk away with something. Um, if you walk away with just one thing, I would suggest the telling and retelling. I think that's the most powerful thing here. The way that we did it here is different from what they call telling and retelling in, in education in the US. That's where you usually have a literacy specialist, reading specialist, have a kid read something and then tell the, the person what they read so they can I check their understanding. Me up there. I was like, oh, yeah, I can tell what happened. Yeah. Wait a minute. Wait yeah. <laughs> but when they actually do that, oh, that was <laughs> All right. Well, Brent. Thank you again. Uh, yeah. Really yeah. look forward to yeah. seeing you around. Um, you I'm a resource for you anytime. Online. You have a question uh, online. Uh, who? There's a question online. Okay. okay, what's the question? Um, after you're doing retelling, retelling, is there a point uh -huh. in there where you have uh, the pairs share uh, uh, gentle recommendations or changes? Yes. Yes. When they do it, yeah. They ask these questions. And if you email me, I'll send you all the material on this. But what they do is they say, they first say, um, the kid who's told the story says, what did I do to make this a good storyteller? And then their partner responds, telling them specific things that they did that made it a good storytelling. And then the storyteller will ask their partner, what could I do to make it even better? Okay, so, and I'm, uh, very, I'm, I'm very particular about that language because first they're saying, what did I do to make this a good storytelling? They're admitting to themselves and others that they did a good job. And then the other, what could I do to make it even better? So they're really open to learning new things when they do that. So this would entail role modeling from us first? Yep, and I, yeah, and I role model that whole thing. And if you email me, I'll send you the whole book and, or I'll send you articles on this that walk through it step by step and answer the exact question that you just asked. Okay, my dear, gonna sheesh. Well, sheesh, thank you. I was gonna say there's a lot that we didn't get to cover. And if you have questions, please reach out to Brett. Because I mean, there's a lot we didn't 